Hey YouTube, this is Troy. Um, it's a continuation on a video series that I have about allergy control. So uh, this is the second uh, the second video on that. On that, um, there might be three total because I don't think I'll get it through everything I want to talk about in this particular video. But last video I talked a lot about the two different types of phosphate being soluble reactive phosphate and organic phosphate. And a couple things I did not talk about that I want to touch base on in this particular video is when you buy a test kit for your local fish store, it's testing soluble reactive phosphate. It's the phosphate that's in your water column. It's the phosphate that algae can consume. And you hear a lot of people on blogs saying, listen, I test for phosphate, it's zero. I test for nitrate, it's zero. How in the world do I have algae, right? Well, the thing to keep in mind is Soluble reactive phosphate probably contributes to or accounts for less than 5% of the phosphate in your tank. So what you're testing for is an aspect of phosphate that is, that is very minute in your tank. And, and also it's constantly being consumed by algae and your corals and what have you. So it may be producing at a rate that it's consuming. Um, you know, if you get one of those tests, a, a phosphate test, and it actually reads something, that means you have a tremendous amount of phosphate in your tank. So it's part of the reason why, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a phosphate test. I had one in the beginning, tossed it, because it, you almost have to go on faith. If you have algae, you have phosphates, you need to do something about it. Um, you know, the organic phosphate, which is the majority of what's in your tank from a phosphate standpoint, it's, it's, you need special equipment to be able to test for that. Um, it's not in the water column, it's, it's in the organic, you know, in the organic material. So it's in your rock, it's in your, in your salt, so, or in your sand, sorry. So um, I want to touch on that. So there's, there's kind of that difference there. And what ends up happening is, if, you know, you put, you know, those of you that are putting dry rock that's not cultured into your tank, you know, you, that might be, that might have a high organic phosphate level, or it might have a lot of organics in it that hasn't broken down yet. And you're putting it in a very low phosphate environment. When you put it, when you set up your tank for the first time, there's no phosphates in the thing. So that's why your rock leaches phosphates. It's gonna naturally leach out any kind of phosphates that it has into, a, into that very low phosphate type environment. So. I just want to touch on that. So that's, you know, if, if people are confused because they run the test and they don't have any phosphates but they got a ton of algae, you have phosphates, don't worry. They're, but the soluble reactive phosphate is such a, a low percentage of the total phosphate, if you, if you take into account also the organic phosphates in your tank, um, that they're just being consumed as fast as they're being produced, basically. Um, all right, so fighting phosphates, fighting nitrates, you know, a lot of people, use algae to fight algae. Um, so that's where you get like the refugiums, you get algae scrubbers, and th they can work. You know, in this tank, I'm not gonna show you, but uh, if you look at some of my prior uh, videos and you see the, um, the sump, I probably have a 10 gallon refugium chamber in my sump. But for a 90 gallon system like this, I probably need upwards to 60 to 50, you know, anywhere from 55 to 60 gallon refugium to actually, you know, actually affect anything inside the main display tank. Um, what I use my refugium for now is is to cultivate, you know, copepods, anthropods, you know, and and that's largely about it. You know, I don't really use it in the in the um, intent of fighting algae in my display tank with algae that's down in my refugium. Um, the reason why that is, is you know, algae again can only consume the soluble reactive phosphate. I, and it, it's, you know, the, at the algae you put down there, the microalgae, it's gonna consume it at, at a fairly consistent rate as the nuisance algae that's in your tank. I want something that, that can outcompete that nuisance algae and that's why I lean a little bit more towards bacteria. You know, and the, the you know, there's a few different things, and I touched on in the first video, but obviously bacteria can can um, can rapidly reproduce at a rate that that will outpace 
algae. It will consume the nutrients in your tank at a faster rate than the algae will. Um, it's more efficient that way. In addition to, once those nu nutrients are, is cons are consumed, so once that, those soluble reactive phosphates are consumed in your tank and they go down to the level of zero, your algae will die off. It will die off. Your bacteria will not. Because your bacteria will go from consuming the soluble reactive phosphate, which is the easier phosphate to consume, to the organic phosphate, the phosphate that's in your rock, the phosphate that's in your sand. And even when all that phosphate's gone, it can, bacteria can actually store these nutrients up and basically what I call store it up for a rainy day. So when all this stuff is gone and depleted, it can kind of go into its, into its storage and start consuming things that it's kind of put in the reserve. Algae doesn't have that capability. Once, there's, once the phosphates are gone, it's dead. It's going to die off. So, you know, some of the big things that we use to try to make sure we maintain the tank in such a way, and I kind of talked about this a little bit, you know, skimmers, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a huge proponent for, for a skimmer, uh, a really good one plus skimmer, so one plus the size that's rated for your tank. Um, you know, make sure you keep that cup and the neck of your skimmer clean, do a full cleaning of your skimmer every six months. You know, filter socks, when I first started, I thought they were a pain in the butt, I didn't use them. Since then, I've switched over. I, I use them. I switch them out every three or four days. I have, uh, you know, a dozen of them or so, and you know, it could be a whole different video on how I manage filter socks, clean them out, and all that sort of thing. GFO, three to four weeks, I swap out my GFO. Water changes, like I said before, I do about 20%. I'm going to switch over it every two weeks now. I was doing every week in the midst of my battle, but now I'm going to switch back to two weeks. And then bacteria. So this is bacteria to fight algae. That's my, that's, my, uh, that's my weapon of choice, so to speak. My last video I talked about Waste Away, Dr. Tim's Waste Away. That's what I'm using right now on this tank. That's what I've been using for the last you know, six months now, or six weeks now. Um, really good results from that. Um, I'm gonna move into carbon dosing. So carbon dosing's been around for a long time. When it, when it first started out, people were dosing like vodka or sugar or vinegar. There's zeofit systems that you can use with different dosage to to you know kind of mimic the similar concept. Um, you know, carbon dosing. Really, what that's all about is feeding and growing bacteria, feeding and growing bacteria that consume your nitrates and your phosphates. Um, so, you know, if, if you're going to carbon dose, you know the bacteria they'll with, once the bacteria has all the, the phosphates and nitrates and other nutrients kind of locked into itself, you need to export it. You still need to export because you have a closed system. The, the bacteria that's got all the nutrients locked in it is not going to automatically just diminish and go away in your system. You have to somehow export that out of your system. Water changes is, an, is, is a way. Skimming is a, is a huge way. And your coral will actually eat that. Your, it'll benefit your coral. That's why kind of you see the zeofit systems are kind of like that with, with coral food or, or enriching your coral, coral nutrients. Um, I'm electing to use bio pellets. It's something that you know has been around for you know several years. Um, but that's the kind of the path that I'm going around. The, basically, the the bio pellets is a concentrated form of carbon. Um, they are, like I said before, food for your bacteria. Um, all carbon reactors or, or bio pellet reactors, sorry, will have some kind of tumbling motion. Um, and, and basically what that tumbling motion does is that you know the bacteria that have all the nutri nutrients locked in, that tumbling motion pushes that bacteria off of the bio pellets and it goes out the outlet back into your system. Now you know, you have your, your inlet going into the, the reactor and then your outlet, you know, basically going back into your system. It's important that that outlet is basically, um, you know, feeding into your skimmer, basically. And, and, and you can basically just run that hose right up to the inlet of your skimmer. Your skimmer then will skim that off. And I made mention of that in my prior video, but that's the beauty about this. You know, you use the bacteria to consume all of the nitrates and phosphates, then use the skimmer to skim it off. Um, 
you can't do that with you know an, if you're using algae to fight algae. You know, you either gotta you know groom the algae. You know, if you gotta you know you basically just once your algae grows to a certain point, you take some of it out of your out of your refugium, etc. But um, the big thing, and I think my next video is going to be all about my particular uh, bio pellet reactor. I did a lot of research. There's explicit reasons why I picked mine, and I think there's some reasons why you should shy away from others. Um, you know, the whole tumbling motion is extremely important. Um, you know, if your if your bio pellets are not tumbling, um, you know they they can produce. Um, hydrogen sulfide, which is obviously poisonous to your system. So it's important that you get that tumbling action in, inside your reactor. Um, a good reactor to do that. You know, the, the one thing I'm going to talk in my next video, and I'm actually going to close this video up. If you guys have any questions or, or whatnot, please comment. But um, the, the, the big thing about, in my opinion, about a biopellet reactor is being able to control how much of your system's water is flowing through that reactor. And the reason why I say that is, um, you know, you don't want to have, I mean, the reason why you're carbon dosing is to have a very low nutrient system. So you have very low phosphates, very low nitrates, but you do not want to have completely zero of both because you will bleach out your corals and they will die. Your corals will eat. Your corals need some phosphate and nitrate to thrive. At least from what I've researched, and in my opinion, that's pretty critical. So um, you can get in trouble with a bio pellet reactor. And uh, my next video, because I'm coming up, I'm over 12 minutes on this one. But uh, my next video will be about, you know, okay, what's the good and bad with with bio pellets. I'm not going to focus on, you know, vodka dosing and, and any of the other options from a carbon dosing standpoint. If you're interested in with them, research them. I think bio pellets probably the easiest way to go. Um, but uh, that's kind of what I'm going to talk about in the next video. So uh, if you have questions about that, that's fine. You know, the next video will be out in a couple days, I'm guessing. Um, and uh, if you still have questions after that, you know, feel free to comment. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. All right, that's it for this one. Later.